three things that we're asking out of every person in our church this year. Number one, that you'd grow. Number two, that you'd engage. And number three, that you'd share. That you'd grow in your faith, that you you would engage in mission, and that you would share your heart and your testimony, your story, and even your finances in the kingdom of God. Now, today's message is a continuation from last week's, um, and I'm probably not going to finish it. I'll finish it next week. Because I want to talk to each of you about the call of God. Now, if there's something that this guy here is passionate about and loves speaking about, it's the call of God. I just, I've seen how the call of God, uh, when someone participates with God in their calling, I've seen how God takes that person that thinks that they have nothing to offer and turns them into something amazing and something great. You see, our mission as a church is found in one sentence, one tiny sentence, and it's this. It's restoring the call of God in people's lives. That's something that my wife and I are passionate about, each of our staff are passionate about, and that's finding that each of us would walk in the divine purpose for our lives. You see, the call of God gives you your reason for existence. It's what God has placed you on earth to do, and within that calling, he puts a measure of himself. Now, I want you to think about that, that in your life, in your spirit, when you got saved, God deposited a measure of himself inside of you. Peter will, will write later on uh, that, that, that we are all partakers of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. I, I want you to think about that, that you are created to live forever, that there is something great about you that has captured God's heart. And so I want to talk about that today. You see, it's for this very reason that Satan hates you and hates me And he tries to damage that call of God in our lives. He tries to get us worn down, too busy. After our second service, there was a young man that came and said hi to me that he hasn't been to church in six months. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And and we were catching up. He's like, man, Pastor Mike, I've just been busy. I've just been busy and busy. I worked 12 hours. And then after work, I got this going on. I got a side hustle going on. And, And the fact of the matter is, I'm off on weekends. And I'm like, so he's like, he puts his head down. He's like, today got me. I'm glad I came. Today got me. I got I to gotta pay attention to what God wants to do in my life because being too busy actually means that we don't want to pay attention, not to church, but to what God wants to do in our lives. So, so there are many people who are alive, but they're not paying attention to the call that God has placed upon them. And I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about a reset. I, I want to remind you that, that Jesus is the one that can save you. And when he saves you, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And then he cleans you up. And then he sends you out. He, he delegates to you his authority and his power to do for him on this earth what he did when he was on this earth. You know, in America, we have believed the great lie that Casting out demons and laying hands on the sick is only for the professional clergy that we pay. But that is such a great lie because we are all called to do that. All of us are called to do that. You are called to do that. I am called to do that. And, 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 but because we have this Western culture and this mentality that says, I pay somebody to lay hands on my kids. When my kid has a fever, I shouldn't have to call anybody to do that. I should lay hands on my kid. And so, so where do we get this from? Well, in Acts 10, 38, we read that scripture says this, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Family, if Jesus did that, you can do that. Understand that. Now, I'm not saying that you and I are Jesus because we're not divine like Jesus. We are not God, but I will tell you that you are a mini Jesus on this earth. And God wants to use you to do some pretty incredible things. The great theologian and author C.S. Lewis said this when he's speaking about God. He says, he seems to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to do slowly and bludgeringly what he could do perfectly in the twinkling of an eye. Creation seems to be delegation through and through. So God could do whatever he wanted to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, in an instant. But instead, he says, no, 
I'm going to delegate to my people the ability to do over time what I could do in a moment. Because there's some things that we need to learn about God as we walk with him and participate with him. God expects that you and I be productive. Can I get amen? He wants you to be invested into what he's doing inside of you and in this world. And that's why, family, we have to pay attention to our calling. And we must develop our spirituality and protect that calling. Because again, let me remind you that this world will try to steal that calling from you. It'll steal it from you. Disappointment will try to steal it from you. Anger, depression, discouragement, all these emotions that attack us will try to tell us don't participate in the call of God because it hurts too much and it costs too much. Let me me explain with a story today and then I'm gonna let you go. I, I wanna share with you guys a true story that happened 2,000 years ago. There was this man who who thought he was serving God, but he really wasn't. Um, And one day he finds Jesus, and he surrenders his heart to Jesus, and he's radically changed. I mean, you can't even tell who he is the moment after he gets saved. And, And for the next 30 years, this man served the Lord, and he did amazing things. In fact, God called him to establish churches all over the world, and he paid a price for his for his faith. And for what God was calling him to do, he paid it with his body because he was often beaten and put in prison for his faith. And now, 30 years after being saved, he's in prison awaiting his execution. Along the way, though, throughout those 30 years, he mentored many men and many women. God used them to heal the sick. He even raised the dead back to life. Beaten so often, shipwrecked in the sea because of his faith in Jesus. He arrives one day to a city named Ephesus, and under his ministry, revival hits so hard in that city that the entire business district of the city went bankrupt because the main business in that city was selling little idols to the goddess Diana. And so, and so when, when people were getting saved, they were no longer buying these little idols and, and all these shops went out of business and all the witches and the soothsayers came to, to him and they burned their witchcraft books because of faith in Jesus. You wanna know, family, what revival is? Now let me tell you something, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but, but downtown on 3rd Avenue, where all the Mexican stores are, there's a store that sells witchcraft. And every time I drive by that store, I curse it in the name of Jesus. Now you might say, well, are you cursing? No, I'm not cursing people. I'm saying, Jesus, may that business go down and may those business owners find you a savior. That's revival. When revival hits the city, not not just the church, but when it hits the city, something is happening. And so you need to understand that, that now Now this revival had hit Ephesus, and there was two young men that heard about what was going on. They lived 100 miles away, and they came to check it out. And when they heard the preaching of this old man, they got saved, and God changed them. And and this man, when he saw these two guys, he's like, man, there's something different about you two. You two are different, and so I don't want you to go home yet. Will you stay here with me for two years, and, and let me teach you scripture. Let me teach you doctrine. Let me teach you what it is to lead. And then I want you guys to go back home. And so they decided they were in their, in their twenties and they decided to stay there for two years with this man. And he becomes their spiritual father and, and he imparts to them what God had given to him. And, and after two years, he says, all right, now I want you guys to go back home and I want you to plant one church in three different cities. These cities were called Hierapolis, Colossae, and Laodicea. It's basically, the distance is, is Moses Lake Warden and Ephrata. That's how these three cities were, were from each other. And, and I want you guys to go back and I want you to plant these churches. And, and so one of, the young men, one of the young men, his name was Epaphras. And he, he's all in. I mean, he, he got radically saved and, and God changed him. And, and Epaphras was like, Paul, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want. And he gave his all and he goes back and he plants these churches and and he loves the people that God led him to. And and the fire of the Holy Spirit was very powerful in his life. And and he was characterized for his hunger for, for more of God and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, fully invested in what God wanted to do in his life and in the lives of others. The other, the other young man who was basically his spiritual twin brother, his name was Archippus. 
Archippus was a strong and bold young man. He was known for his sacrifice and his service. He, he was really the workhorse. He was the one that would open the church up and he would close the church up. The first one there, the last one to leave. He was the one mopping the floors and sweeping. He was the one giving Bible studies. He was the one that wherever there was a need, he's like, that might not be my calling, but it's, it's a need, so I'm here to fulfill the need. And, and he was known to be a helper of people and, and he was a lover of God and, and he would do anything for the call of God. And both he, Archippus, and Epaphras literally changed that entire region for the kingdom of God. And now seven years have passed. Stay with me. I promise I'm coming to a close with this story. And Epaphras hears that his spiritual father is in Rome and he's in prison, but he can receive visitors. So Epaphras goes to visit his spiritual father, who we know as the Apostle Paul. And Epaphras goes to visit him, and they hug, and they embrace, and Paul wants to know, hey, how are the people of the church? See, Paul never had the honor or the privilege of going to, to these three churches. He just knew them through the stories of Epaphras, and, and he asked Epaphras, how, how, are these, how are these churches doing? Give me a report. How are the people doing? And, and Epaphras shares some stories, and then he says, uh, there's a problem, Paul, because some false teaching has entered the church. People are saying that Jesus is not God, that Jesus was just an angel. And because of that, these people that have come into our church, they are telling others to worship angels now. And now everybody has a little picture of an angel and everybody's worshiping angels and they think that Jesus is just one of the other archangels in heaven. And so Paul, Paul in, in his theological self, I'm sure got angry. You see, can I tell you family and those of you who are watching online, what you believe about God is important. It matters. It matters that you know scripture. I, I know today we don't, we don't really want to get into the Bible as much, and, but it's important that you know what you believe. It, it's important that you know that Jesus is God and that he's the son of God. It, it's important to know that there's salvation in no other name. Your works cannot save you. Your family name cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. It's important that you know what you believe. It's important that you know your core values and the tenets of your faith. You see, in this crazy world that we are living in, there is such a need for people of strong faith and strong conviction. You need to have that if you don't. Let me get back to this story real quick. So Paul, there in prison, he hears about this teaching of angels. He has another spiritual son there named Timothy. And, and you see, Paul wanted to write, but by this time, he's in his mid-60s, and that's not too old. But, but the thing is, is he had been beaten so much that he, his hand shook like this, and, and he could hardly see anymore because of the years of being abused by, by people and, and beaten. His, his eyesight was failing him. So he says, Timothy, I want you to get the parchment out, I want you to get a pen out, and I want you to write what I'm about to tell you. And so he begins talking about who Jesus is, and Timothy is writing all these notes down, writing all these things, and, and Paul goes on to dictate to him three chapters of theological power that you can read through the book of Colossians when you have a chance. And then as he's about to close this book, this letter, he says, Epaphras, is there anything else that I need to know about the churches? Anything else that I need to write about? And Epaphras, as I ask you that, I'm just remembering, where's Archippus at? Before you guys couldn't be separated. You've been here for a couple days and you haven't told me about my other spiritual son, Archippus. What's up with him? Where is he at? And Epaphras, I'm sure he's pacing. You know, he's, he, he loves his spiritual father, but kind of intimidated by him as well. And, and he's like, well, um, Dad, it's just that I, I didn't know whether or not I should tell you this, but um, Archippus has changed. Something's wrong with him. His attitude has changed. He, he hasn't walked away from God, but, but you could see that he's on the road to walk away from God. He's lost his fire. 
He's lost his zeal. For some reason, he's become lazy in his faith, and then he's not praying anymore, and he's not growing anymore, he's, and not growing in his faith. And instead of growing as a leader, he's decided to put things on cruise control and, and just simply go through the motions. Uh, Paul, I, I hate to tell you this, but people have stung him. The church has stung him. Ministry has stung him. He's, he was going all out, all out, all out. And the mistake that Archippus made is it, it, he got lost in his service so much so that he forgot to feed himself spiritually and he got so busy that he got burnt out. And he got, he got stung. And so he's at church, Paul, but he's not connected. He, he's not encouraged anymore. He, he's there, and when we really need, need help, we can call on him, but he, that, that glow that he used to have, he doesn't have that anymore. You know, when you first get saved and you first give your heart to Jesus, something inside of you naturally shifts because the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, and, and you get excited about things, and, and life, all of a sudden, you see it from a different point of view, and Archippus had forgotten about that. Man, when he first got saved, he was always with us at the church, serving, preaching, helping, teaching. No one was better than him. The guy was straight up fire. There was nothing that he wouldn't do for the churches, nothing he wouldn't do for the call of God, always sharing the goodness of God with people on the street. But now all of that is gone. And he's with us, but he's not with us. He's not growing, he's not engaging, and he's not sharing. And if I can be honest with you, and some of you are new to church, and some of you are veterans of church already, and you've been in church for a long time, whether it's here or another church, you, you've been to church, and you know how church can sting you. You know how church can hand you a raw deal. And in our walk with Jesus, um, it's very easy to put things on cruise control because of how people have treated us. When we start out excited and we're growing and we're serving and we're volunteering, we're engaged in mission, but over time, we begin to see things that we don't like that bother us and we forget about our calling and we begin to look at people and say, well, I don't want to be like that hypocrite. That leader is doing this and he shouldn't be doing it and they're doing it this way and I don't agree with it. And all of a sudden, we forget about our calling and we begin to put our eyes on people who fail us. And if you've been in church or Christianity or, or, or I was going to say in Spanish, mas bien, but better said, uh, not Christianity, but churchianity. We're more plugged into church than we are to Christ. And, and we get stung. We get stung because, because we really haven't developed roots we really haven't developed relationship. Now, don't get me wrong. You can have relationship and you can have roots and still get stung. You're looking at a guy who's been in church all his life, 46 years, and I've been stung by people. I've been hurt by people. I've been lied about. I've been said this and that. And, and it stings. The sting is real. And if you've been in church, you know that, that, that feeling. And if we're not careful, we'll forget about how God rescued us. We'll forget about who God is and what he's done and we'll begin to make excuses. We'll begin to miss church a little bit more, not because of God, but because of people. Because we always say that, well, I still love God. I'm just, I'm just disappointed in his people. But we just begin to, to do less and less in our walk with the Lord. And, and things that at one time we had cut out attitudes and habits and even people, relationships, because we backed away a little bit from faith, we begin to allow these things back into our lives. And by the way, I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm just here to tell you that, that that's just human, the human condition when we take our eyes off of Jesus. And that fire, the Holy Spirit inside of each of us, it's quenched because because we've been stung by life. We still go to church, but it's not the same. So back to my story, as Paul hears Epaphras kind of share a little bit about Archippus, Paul says, all right, Timothy, I got just a few more words 
for you to write before we send the letter to the Colossians. And Timothy hears everything and he writes the rest. And he seals it. And he gives it to another spiritual son named Tychicus and another one named Onesimus. And you might say, man, these are weird names. Well, remember, we're, we're not in America when this is happening. And, and he says, all right, guys, I want you to take this to the Colossians. And I want you to read it to all three churches publicly, out loud, in front of everybody. And so Tychicus and, and Onesimus go back to Colossae. And, and I can imagine that the church is excited because they're going to hear finally from the great apostle Paul. And they're excited to hear the news. And, 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 and so Tychicus gets there and, and now he's in front of the church. Now remember, it wasn't, it wasn't a church like we have church today. It was more of like a home. And a bunch of people squished into that home. And Tychicus opens up the scroll and Paul begins to lay down some rich theological truths to the church that would show them that Jesus is not an angel, that Jesus is the son of God and Jesus is God. He writes things like this. There's redemption by the blood of Jesus and there is peace through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. He writes, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You see Jesus, you see God, you see God, you see Jesus. He says, Jesus created all things and is before all things. Jesus is the head of, his, of the church, his body. In Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead, and you are complete in him. And by dying and resurrecting, Jesus disarmed the enemy. The enemy doesn't have power over you because Jesus disarmed him. What great theological truths to remind the Colossians and remind you and I that Jesus is God and salvation is only found in him. And I'm sure that people are convicted by this as they're hearing Tychicus read it. And, and, and I'm sure that some of them are crying as they're being corrected about their, their doctrine. And at the very end of the letter, Tychicus has it and he's reading and he comes to what we would know as verse 17. Now, I want to remind you that, that he's, he's going to read this in front of the entire church. And, he, and he, he has the scroll, and he comes to what, like I said, what we know, verse 17. And say to Archippus. Now, Archippus was there. He was sitting in the back. It was like where Steve would be right now, sitting in the back. And I can just imagine, this is just me, this is the movie in my mind. As he reads it, and he reads the name Archippus, and he sees Archippus, and he sees what he's got to read, and he sees the people there. He's saying, oh, shoot. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Just one sentence. And if you and I don't know the context and we don't understand the story, we, go, we skip through that, we don't pay attention, and then we move on to the next book. And we ignore this small, tiny sentence that maybe doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but to the apostle, it meant enough to include it in this theological book. Archippus, if you don't pay attention, you are gonna lose out on what God is doing in your life. Archippus, fulfill your calling that God gave you. Son, your calling doesn't come from another human. Your calling doesn't come from an emotion. It comes from God, and you've been set apart since you were in your mother's belly to accomplish the mission that God has put you on earth to do. Wake up, son. There's too much at stake here. People need what you carry. Stop with the excuses. Stop feeling offended. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and get up and fulfill the call of God on your life. Now oh, the hurt is real. The sting is real. I'm not up here pretending that when somebody stings you that it's not a real pain. I'm not saying that when you've been divorced that it feels like a death. I'm not saying that when you've lost a loved one that it doesn't hurt. But what I am saying is, is it's time to heal. It's time to heal. You can't live hurt the rest of your life. You can't live offended the rest of your life. 
And I feel like the Apostle Paul says, Archippus, whatever is holding you back, it's time for a reset. It's time to start over, son. Remember the fire of the Holy Ghost inside of you. Remember the day that you were saved. Remember the first time that you felt the love of God in your life. Remember everything that God rescued you from. It's time to stand up and fulfill what God has placed on your life. And maybe, son, you have a real reason to be hurt. It's time to get up. I'm here to call your attention, Archippus. It's time to fight for your faith again. It's time to be useful. Don't allow somebody to steal your fire. Don't allow the enemy to steal your joy. Archippus, we need you. Archippus, the kingdom of God needs you. Archippus, your family needs you. My wife and I, this summer, will, in August, will complete 20 years of pastoral ministry in this church. And, and through the years, we've, we've had people at this altar and in the and the Sendero Chapel altar, give their heart to Jesus, excited. We, we've seen people's lives transformed. I, I, I got to, on Friday, I, I got to take a man to Tri-Cities to our church over there. To, he was going to look at the building because he's going to paint it for us. And he's a former addict and a former um, alcoholic. And, and he's sharing his story with me. And I'm asking him, tell me your story. And as he's sharing his story, he's like, ooh, it's hot in this car. Is it, is it hot in this car or is it just me? I go, no, man, that's just the Holy Ghost. Keep going. And, and he's telling me his story. And he's like, oh, Mike, I'm, oh, oh, stop asking me. I'm like, I'm not even asking you. You're telling me everything. And he's like, man, I'm sweating in here. And he's telling me his story and, and how he's done this and done that. And, and then, and then, and then he, he just starts weeping. And I'm like, are you okay? He's like, thank you. And I said, for what? Thank you for welcoming people like me in your church. I did AA, and AA couldn't do anything for me. I never knew my dad, Mike, never knew my dad. But this church has been to me what a dad could never be for me. And I see and I hear stories like that that rock my life. But then through the years, I've seen people who have given their heart to the Lord and serve, and then life stings them. You know, this summer, I, I decided there was something that would hurt me and sting me a lot is as I, I, I decided to to remove the Facebook app from my phone. Because you know, it's so tempting when you're bored to just jump on there and start scrolling. And I was starting to see too many people who had been saved at this church forget about their calling and live against what God would call them to be and to do. And so we took a vacation this summer and I said, well, I'm gonna just delete it during vacation. And when I get back, I'll put it back on. And when I got back, I told my wife, I, I don't want to see it anymore. I, I, I'll keep it on my computer so that I can put stuff for the church. Um, but it stings. Just like, just like any parent, you raise your kids to serve the Lord, and then they decide they don't want to serve the Lord. It stings you. You can do everything right. You can lead them down the right path. And at a certain age, they decide whether they are going to serve the Lord or not. And when they don't, it hurts. And through the years, I, I could literally say hundreds have gotten saved at this church who started well and are not finishing well. And they've become an archippus to me. Because if you don't know this, and I'm sure you do, life and church and ministry and people will sting you good. They'll stab you. But can I be honest with you and tell you that that's no reason to walk away? Because we are dealing with flawed people. All of us are flawed. I'm flawed and you're flawed and we're gonna let each other down. And yes, there are hypocrites in church. And yes, there are pastors who are hypocrites. And yes, there are pastors that steal money. 
and cheat on their spouses. And yes, there are church people that do the same. But we serve the Lord. And I want you to notice that in that verse, Paul says, fulfill the ministry that you received in the Lord, from the Lord, not from a denomination, not from a church, not from an eldership or a deacon. You received it from Jesus himself. He's the one that you serve. Archippus, it's time to wake up. And maybe, just maybe, we need to repent. And maybe we need to forgive others. And maybe we need to forgive ourselves. You see, this, on this Valentine's Day, I, I refuse. I, I was talking to a pastor, and he, he's like, hey, Mike, I'm, I'm going to preach on love. 1 Corinthians 13, the love. And I, I looked at him and I'm like, no, nah, I've, I've never been that pastor. I said, my wife, just, my wife and I just preached three weeks ago on love. On Valentine's Day, I, I need to preach about a stronger love and the stronger of the father for his children. How much God loves you, how much the father loves you, that he would include a name of someone that wasn't living up to their calling in scripture to remind us that he's placed expectation on us to walk out the call of God in our lives. And if you're stung and if you're hurt or you're angry or, or, or you'll say things like, I know I'm called, I'm just not ready. Fam, you're never gonna be ready. We're never gonna be ready. We just walk daily. And we pay attention to opportunities and we engage in mission. And the beauty of the church, although it's flawed, the beauty of the church is when you are connected and engaged in mission, you begin to find out what God is calling you to do.